The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, and welcome to the webinar. Today we'll be discussing how to properly plan for outdoor video surveillance projects. My name is David Martin, and I'll be your moderator today. Since 1998, Lunsic has been a trusted security and surveillance partner with experience in the USA and around the world. Lunsic has a background working with many types of industries, and we help customers develop enterprise solutions for complex physical security projects. We've developed a powerful security platform called Perspective Video Management Software. And this enterprise VMS streams and captures IP security video and incorporates video analytics, access control, and more into the software. I'll introduce our speaker in just a moment. I first want to go over a few logistics for the webinar. We'll be taking questions during the webinar, and you can enter your questions in the GoToWebinar panel. It should be towards the bottom. We'll collect those during the presentation and answer questions at the end of the event. We'll also present poll questions during the, the event, and we encourage your participation as answering the questions um, as they are presented. At the end of the webinar, we'll present a survey uh, for attendees. We'll ask uh, you to answer a few quick questions to help us better serve you in future webinar events. If you're interested in a completion certificate for today's webinar, you can in indicate so on the survey. We'll follow up in a few days after the webinar with certificates, answers to questions, and a copy of today's presentation. Also, we record these webinars and post them to our website, and we provide you with the link to the webinar video archive. Linsec sponsors these monthly, and we cover a variety of safety and physical security information. So check back with us often to find out what's coming up next uh, in our Step into Security webinar series. So today's physical security expert is Keith Harris who is the marketing, marketing manager for Lensec. Keith has experience working with customers recommending video surveillance solutions. This includes training law enforcement personnel on video surveillance investigation uh, techniques. Keith has spent many years in the broadcast news industry as a photojournalist and has worked in the video security industry for the past 10 years. So welcome, Keith, and Keith, uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks, David. Good to be here. Uh, today we're going to discuss how to properly plan or outdoor video surveillance projects. Outdoor projects can be as simple as hanging cameras on the outside of the building and routing cables internally to the network. However, uh, the projects can also get uh, complex very quickly. We'll tackle issues like dealing with environmental uh, concerns that can affect operation and placement. In, in many jobs, uh, we will have obstacles to overcome, such as limited or no infrastructure to support our equipment. When you consider some sites need remote cameras across acres of property, then you have to start thinking about how and where to mount the cameras. Installers have to find a way to power the camera, transmit data, and overcome obstacles uh, in their paths. It's, uh, it's the job of the project manager to determine how to get the video and data back to the head end equipment. So we'll look at uh, dealing with wired transmission through conduit or uh, transmitting data wirelessly, and sometimes over great distances. So where do we start? Now let's start with the site survey. Uh, talk is cheap and you can talk about a project all day long, but uh, seeing uh, the site location can speak volumes about the scope of the project and what actually needs to be done. Pre-planning your project is helpful in order to understand priorities, uh, but that work is subjective. So walking the site gets you more information about the scope uh, of what you need to do. You'll understand distances, line of sight challenges, and installation obstacles much better if you actually go to the project site. Uh, these are details that you can't get by just looking at Google Maps. The big picture here is important, but your success will be in the details. Now, before we go too much further, let's get into the first poll question. David? Okay. Sure. Um, I'll launch that here shortly. The, the first poll question here are what are the two most important factors in, inter in determining an outdoor camera position? And if you'll take, you should see that on your screen. If you'll take a moment to uh, make your selection for what are the two most important factors in determining an outdoor camera position: mounting position and field of view, 
power and transmission path, vandal protection, and weatherproof rated equipment. And we'll give you just a few minutes here to uh, make your selection. Okay, looks like everybody has voted. Let's go ahead and see the results here. Looks like uh, most everybody selected mounting position and field of view and a few power and transmission paths. So uh, that could be considered a trick question. All of the, uh, the choices there are important, but power uh, and transmission path are probably the most important in my opinion. Uh, they must be available before any other choice is made. If you don't have any other choices uh, available, then you have to take care of the, the power and the transmission. So we'll spend a little bit of time on those. Uh, when you're designing an outdoor project, ask lots of questions. It's your job to think of everything. And understanding your environment is the most important part. You can use some tools to help gather information about your site. Uh, your site. Google Earth is a good tool for getting some rough measurements for estimating cable runs, target distance, or, or wireless transmission distances. Uh, for security insiders uh, within the industry, the IPVM camera calculator is worth consideration. IPVM's tool is available for pro members and it could help you develop a thorough site design. It allows you to place cameras on a map, uh, you can even visualize the camera field of view, plan for pixels per foot, and uh, choose the right camera for the project. Uh, while you're on site at your project location, I recommend taking pictures during your site survey. You want to take pictures uh, not only of the installation area, but also um, pictures that would represent the field of view of your cameras. This will help you with your planning when you get back to the office. Once you're back, you can label your pictures while the info is still fresh on your mind. If you wait to label the pictures, you won't remember the details later. So make really good notes during and immediately after your site survey. Write it down. You can't, and you can't count on remembering uh, specific details for long after the uh, the site survey is over. Uh, these habits will provide you with a better idea of what your environment is like and make it easier to communicate information with your installation team. You don't want to rely on your memory about the site location since the project may not be installed for many months after the original site plan. There can be many types of uh, project sites but uh, in our uh, scenario here, we're going to take a look at three different types uh, that have some distinct characteristics. No infrastructure uh, means there's no buildings, maybe no power, um, probably in a rural location. Limited infrastructure, uh, in these, this scenario you would have unfinished buildings with no climate control, uh, perhaps power is available, could be either rural or urban. And then a solid infrastructure, um, a solid infrastructure gives you finished buildings on site within reasonably close distance to camera locations. No infrastructure, uh, you know, a good example here would be an oil rig site. Um, you've got no buildings, uh, no power, uh, out in the middle of nowhere. Many questions can come up. Where do you want to deploy your camera? How are you going to mount it and power it? Where is your video going to be stored? How are you transmitting your information? The questions can really truly be endless here. You have a lot of things to think about. Because you have no infrastructure, you may not have an existing position to mount the camera. So you might require a new pole installation to mount the camera. At remote locations, access to the network uh, and even power could be tricky. In rural environments, you may have to plan to transmit data via a cellular data network. And not all cellular data networks are created equal. The more rural the location, the less likely it is going to be to have a solid cellular data signal. Uh, powering equipment may require an electrical power drop or even a solar solution with a battery bank. Bandwidth uh, for your video transmission is also at a premium. If you're using cellular data, the, the cellular companies make big claims about their coverage and bandwidth availability, but they still lack good coverage in rural areas, so you have to test these locations. Um, they're also notorious for restric restricting your data stream 
for those who use a lot of bandwidth. And guess who uses a lot of bandwidth? Uh, those that are deploying video uh, data streams. Um, so just because you cal calculate a maximum data throughput for a location uh, using cellular doesn't mean you'll actually achieve that in a real scenario. Cellular data companies may throttle down your bandwidth uh, without you really even knowing about it. So planning ahead is helpful. Uh, planning for local recording on the edge device or even a rugged server for local recording may be appropriate. If you're recording locally, then you don't have to stream your data continuously. Uh, you may choose to store your data locally and then only stream when you need access to the live or recorded video. Limited infrastructure locations uh, are areas where there are unfinished buildings with no climate control, um, probably with power. Uh, these could be either in a rural or in an urban area. A park location with a pavilion or other uh, light structures would fall into this uh, category. For example, a, a place that has a shed. Um, but uh, you don't have a secure climate controlled environment to deploy your equipment. You're improving your installation environment with limited infrastructure, but you still have to overcome a few things. Even an urban park may not have uh, good infrastructure to work with. Let's take that park pavilion as an example. Uh, the goal here could potentially be to keep an eye on vandalism in the area. The park pavilion is open all, on all sides. Uh, you don't have a secure climate controlled environment. Your pavilion makes a great place to mount the cameras and you probably have access to electricity, but uh, you may not have network access close by to transmit data to the head end equipment. In these situations, uh, you may have to use edge camera storage or find a way to enclose a video server to capture and record the data. When you put a video server in an unprotected environment, then you have to find a way to protect it. So you would use either a rugged server uh, that can withstand the, the climate and environment changes. Um, uh, but not only that, you would also need to probably enclose that in a locking NEMA enclosure that helps to protect it from uh, moisture and dust damage. Transmitting data could require a, a wireless transmission, such as a, a cellular uh, connection, you might need a fiber drop or other potential choices as well. Solid infrastructure gets a little easier. Finished buildings are on site and in reasonably close distance to the camera location. This could be an office building, parking lot, for example. Um, so you definitely have your power in close proximity to camera locations. Um, now you definitely have to have your power close by. Uh, and your video transmission situation is improved by your closer proximity. Um, it's really a best case scenario for in installation in an outdoor project. Um, hanging your cameras and your IP devices on the building is not too hard. You can easily connect the power uh, and the network um, inside the building. When you move the camera positions away from the building, then you, you, you get a little bit more complex. You have to start thinking about where am I going to get power from my equipment and how am I going to get the trans uh, uh, the video information transmitted back to the uh, the building. Mounting your cameras on a light pole in a parking lot could be a logical choice. Uh, you want to make sure you check for power and you want to make sure you verify the voltage, make sure the power isn't on a schedule. Um, you'll also want to think about how you get your video back to the uh, the head end for recording. If you have conduit with Ethernet cable running through the pole, you may be able to use that as your tra uh, transmission path. You want to make sure you consider the cable distance between the, uh, the camera and the, uh, the head end location, and you want to test the cable for continuity. Um, if you're using power over Ethernet to power your camera, you need to be less than 100 meters in cable length from the PoE switch. If you get greater than that, um, the, uh, the, the, the metric distance is 100 meters um, that calculates up to 328 feet. Um, so you'll need a, a mid-span injector or a PoE injector to boost power if you go over that distance in your cable run. Sometimes you can get power over long distances, but don't count on it being reliable. You want to plan to boost that PoE power or find local power for the IP or camera device if you have to transmit over 328 feet. 
If you had to have to add an Ethernet cable run to reach the camera, um, that could require trenching, which could be expensive. Uh, and then uh, another possibility here is to transmit your information wirelessly using a network bridge to connect your cameras to the network. Uh, in many remote camera uh, conditions, uh, pole mounting becomes an option. If you have an existing, consider what your field of view would be from that camera position. Uh, ask yourself uh, questions and then make sure you research the answers. Uh, does the pole survey the target area required? How far is it from the camera position to the target area? And what kind of megapixels are going to be required in order to capture the type of clarity that's required in the video? Are there obstacles that block your field of view or obstruct your line of sight for wireless transmission? All of those are good questions that you need to find the answers to. Uh, if your pole position is not ideal, you may have to add a new pole for camera equipment. This may require bringing in a subcontractor who can help set the pole and provide proper power and a data transmission path from the new pole. Using proper hardware for mounting uh, cameras uh, may require some pre-planning. Consider whether your camera comes with the proper uh, hardware or if you need to purchase it separately. That could be as simple as a special bracket for mounting a specific camera to the pole or uh, using uh, uh, pole straps. Those are stainless steel tra straps that are used to secure the camera to the pole. Uh, you can see those in the uh, displayed picture on the bottom left. When you're mounting uh, to a pole or the exterior of a building, you may require a cherry picker to accomplish the in installation. Consider that during your pre-planning uh, will be very helpful. Um, that will help streamline your installation. You don't want to wait until installation day to find out that you've got to go rent a cherry picker. Do not assume that your installer can use a ladder to install a camera or a NEMA enclosure 20 feet up a pole. Those boxes can be pretty heavy and bulky, making the installation a challenge. Safety and ease of installation is also important here. When you're working around electrical lines, look up and live. Those are important words to remember. You want to make sure that, uh, that you're not surprised by um, getting into uh, lower electrical lines. When you uh, don't have existing Ethernet or conduit installed, trenching add new conduit can be expensive. The cost of digging trenches can vary greatly depending on the job site. Obviously, if you're digging through concrete, it's going to be significantly harder than digging through topsoil. Uh, on one resource I checked here, it shows the cost of approximately $4 to $8 per linear foot just to dig a $500 trench. And I'm providing the link there at the bottom of the page to give you an idea. That only will give you a rough estimate for budgeting. Getting actual quotes from a trenching company will provide you with a more accurate estimate for your project. Make sure when you're using a trenching contractor that they can provide you with a survey of existing utilities before digging. When you're planning uh, cameras for pole mounting, limit your camera quantity to four cameras per pole whenever possible. Aesthetically, it will be more pleasing and less intrusive. Another good reason is bandwidth for data transmission. If you're sending your data wirelessly, you need a NEMA enclosure. Uh, with the proper rugged equipment installed. The enclosure uh, will need a rugged PoE switch in it uh, and a way to connect to your transmission path. You want to make sure your PoE switch is powerful enough to supply power to four IP cameras. Also, the data from these cameras uh, could be transmitted through a wireless antenna to the network. But you want to make sure that the transmission bandwidth available is enough to handle the data that the cameras will output. Uh, this NEMA enclosure may also have to be installed on the pole adjacent to the cameras and the transmitter. In some circumstances, the enclosure may have to house a local rugged video server or other equipment. The size of the enclosure is dependent upon the equipment that needs to be housed inside. Uh, installed equipment may be rugged. Uh, consider uh, a NEMA enclosure that will have a fan anyway. If your fan, you have a fan on there, it helps to dissipate the moisture and the heat. Even though the equipment is rugged, it still helps with the overall uh, life of the installed equipment. 
edge recording on a pole-mounted camera has advantages. Uh, and what I'm referring to here is um, a video stored on an SD card that is, is deployed in the camera. That works well as a backup tool, but you don't want to consider that as your sole video storage solution. Getting camera access to receive, uh, retrieve stored video data could be difficult if the camera is hanging 20, 25 feet up a pole. However, some edge storage uh, could be accessible through the network. In this case, uh, edge storage as a backup to the video server storage could be quite helpful. Now, SD cards are, are now available with uh, uh, large capacity storage, 256 gigabytes and even 512 gigabytes. Uh, gigabytes on uh, SD cards was unheard of uh, until just a few years ago. But you also need to make sure that your IP camera is designed to use a large capacity card. Some cameras are now capable of accepting up to 128 gigabyte SD cards for local storage, but you have to know the camera and know the specifications for what it'll hold. Axis recently announced a partnership with SanDisk to provide uh, high performing edge storage solutions optimized for video surveillance applications. That it means a micro SDXC card sized at 64 gigabytes, and that's compatible with Access products that have edge storage capability. Cameras with multi-stream capability may be able to store high resolution video locally while transmitting a lower resolution video stream for remote viewing. This is ideal if you have a limited transmission bandwidth available, such as a cellular connection. Ethernet cables can be run outdoors, uh, but the thin plastic casing will deteriorate quickly when exposed to the element. For best results, outdoor Ethernet cables should be placed in a conduit and um, buried a fair distance away from power lines or other sources of electrical interference. Uh, remember to use shielded twisted pair cable if the camera is being used outdoor, outdoors, or if the uh, network cable is routed outdoors. The uh, shielding protects the transmission line from electromagnetic interference leaking into or out of the cable. Uh, PVC or other plastic pipe installed with waterproofing can work as the conduit. Notice in the picture that we have on screen here, you've got uh, um, cables coming straight out of the back of the camera. Um, I, I would uh, much prefer to see a clean installation using a flex conduit. Uh, off the back of that camera to uh, provide a much better connect, uh, protection for the cables that are coming out. Uh, another possibility is direct burial Cat5 cable. It costs more, uh, but it's specifically designed for outdoor use. Both ordinary and direct burial Cat5 cables uh, are capable of attracting lightning strikes to some degree. Simply burying a cable underground does not lessen its uh, ability to uh, receive a lightning strike. Cat5 surge protectors should be installed as part of the outdoor ethernet networks in order to guard against lightning strikes. Ensure that you've got the right PoE for environmental conditions. Uh, a PoE power to a device becomes much more critical depending on temperature. Many devices can function at different low temperature levels based on the, the power available. Uh, make sure you're using properly rated equipment. Uh, on your project. Now it's time for our second poll question, David. Okay, I'll launch that in a second here. Um, the poll question number two is why is line of sight important in a wireless transmission? Uh, not important if TX is in the range of RX. Transmission data travels in a straight line between TX and RX, and TX will have a reduced signal at RX when obstruction um, are near. So we'll give you a few moments to make your selection and then we'll show the results here. Okay, we'll go ahead and uh, launch the results. Looks like most chose uh, the third choice, TX will have reduced signal at RX when obstructions are near.
And Keith, I'll uh, hand it back to you. Okay, sorry about that. Um, the uh, the line of sight is, is subject to um, obstructions even outside of the, the normal range. So you have to be cautious about that. It's a common standard for wireless data transmission, but it doesn't describe the whole picture. Uh, the term line of sight refers to uh, an unobstructed path between two points. Uh, for wireless transmission, it means that the signal does not have to pass through any objects before reaching a receiver. It's important, however, to remember that wireless transmission moves in waves rather than in straight lines. That means that objects could interfere with the wireless signal by simply being too close to a signal path rather than fully obstructing it. And in a radio transmission, the safe zone or line of sight transmission is known as the Fresnel zone. Radio frequencies travel in an ellipsoid shaped area uh, between the access point and the client. And that ellipsoid shape is called the Fresnel zone that you see here in the picture. Uh, as the distance uh, between the AP and the client increases, the radius at the midpoint also increases. So the antenna needs to be placed at a height greater than the midpoint radius above any obstruction. Uh, for any math geeks out there, I've included the uh, calculation for the, the midpoint radius on the screen. But I've also got a link here on the page that will help you uh, with the calculator that will help calculate that, that Fresnel clearance zone. You'll need to make sure that the, uh, the Fresnel zone is clear of any obstructions between the AP and the client. Uh, with only a 20% obstruction, you start to see some signal loss. A good rule of thumb, though, is not to exceed 40% obstruction. That's when you start to see significant signal loss above 40%. Obstructions can range from buildings, trees, and even the earth. Uh, it's worth noting that water absorbs radio waves. So while a tree may be minimal obstruction, the water on the leaves could absorb the radio waves and have a big uh, impact on signal quality in the Fresnel zone. Uh, another important uh, factor in wireless transmission is the RF environment where products are installed. Uh, radio frequency is referred to as RF, is a rate of oscillation in a range of around 3 kilohertz to 300 gigahertz. Uh, that corresponds to a frequency of radio waves and the alternating currents which carry radio signals. RF usually refers to electrical rather than mechanical oscillations. Uh, other access points, cell towers, or other wireless devices can create a noisy RF environment, and that causes interference in your signal. Uh, the good access point uh, that could determine automatically how much interference uh, there is and adjust channels uh, on the transmission power accordingly. So look for a good access point that has that as a feature. But in noisy RF environments, um, you, you could have a limited range uh, and other challenges due to interference. So you'll want to survey your urban environments for RF interference uh, when you're doing a site survey or, or determining if wireless transmission will be uh, a choice for you. You can make sure you can, you can find tools that will help you with, do a spectrum analysis on your own or you can find a contractor that can, uh, that can help you with that. A couple of different types of uh, remote data transmission. Point-to-point uh, -point connection refers to communications uh, between two nodes or endpoints. The term point-to-point -point or P2P uh, relates to fixed wireless data communications for transmission via radio frequencies in the multi-gigahertz range. In all cases, P2P transmission expects that a clear line of sight is present and uh, capable of being beamed in a fairly tight transmission path between two points. If clear line of sight is impossible due to obstructions, network antennas uh, should be configured con together uh, to create an antenna hop, uh, and that'll virtually bend the transmission around obstacles. Another feature of advanced P2P transmission is multiple input or multiple output, also called MIMO, M-I-M-O. This is a method for uh, multiplying the capacity of a radio link 
using multiple transmit and receive antennas to exploit a multi-path transmission. MIMO uh, specifically refers to a practical technique for sending and receiving more than one data signal on the same radio channel at the same time. Point to multipoint is called P2MP. This is a communication which is accomplished um, via uh, a distinct type of one-to-many connection, uh, providing multiple paths for a, from a single location to multiple locations. P2MP uh, most typically is used in wireless IP transmission via a gigahertz radio frequency. P2MP systems uh, could be either single or bi-directional systems. A central antenna broadcasts or receives transmissions uh, from several antennas. The base station uh, could have a single uh, omnidirectional antenna or multiple sector antennas, uh, such as what you see up here in the, uh, the picture on the upper right. Um, and that's, uh, those are often used to increase both range and capacity. Another type of transmission is referred to as a wireless, wireless mesh network, also known as mesh. Uh, it's a communication network made up of radio nodes organized in a mesh topology that you'll see in your picture here with the blue dots. Mesh often consists of mesh clients, mesh routers, and gateways. The clients are referred to as, uh, are often the wireless devices, such as IP cameras, etc. And the mesh routers forward traffic to and from the gateways. So here, here you see a visual uh, description of what a mesh network might look like. Like the coverage area of the radio nodes uh, work as a single network and sometimes called a mesh cloud. Access to the mesh cloud is dependent upon the radio nodes working in harmony with each other to create a radio network. The mesh network is, is reliable and it offers redundancy. This means that uh, one node uh, can stop working and the rest of the nodes can still communicate with each other, routing information down multiple paths to work around a malfunctioning node. Let's talk a little bit about power. Uh, it's important to consider where your power is com coming from and what its quality will be for powering your IP cameras and edge devices. Um, most CCTV cameras operate on DC power, either 12 volt or 24 volt. Modern security cameras will be dual voltage, meaning that they can use either 12 or 24 volt power. Cameras uh, uh, may need to connect to a local AC power outlet using an, an adapter, depending on, on how they're configured. IP cameras uh, usually get their power via the Ethernet cable using PoE. Uh, remember, PoE distance via Ethernet cable is under 100 meters or 328 feet. Anything further than that uh, in cable distance from the PoE switch will need a PoE injector or a mid-span injector. Um, if you add a PoE injector or a mid-span in the external environment, Make sure it's rugged and weatherproof. Um, these also must get their power from somewhere, so plan accordingly. If you're tapping into local power, such as a light pole, don't forget to test the power. Just because the power line is there doesn't mean the power is available for use. Also, some power to parking lot lights may run on a schedule. It may not be hot power 24-7. It may only operate on a dust to dawn schedule. So you also want to make sure that you have clean AC power as well. That's power that's free from voltage spikes and drops. Voltage noise is outside of the ideal range for the equipment uh, and uh, it can cause electronic equipment to perform poorly. Dirty power can damage equipment over time uh, or it could uh, potentially create power surges which can damage your equipment. Use a power conditioner to help filter out the voltage noise uh, and minimize other uh, damage from power surges. If you're sending power over a lengthy distance, you should be uh, beware of voltage drop. There are many factors uh, that can contribute to voltage drop. Some of those are uh, cable distance, gauge of the cable, AC, AC versus DC, uh, and then there's also other uh, factors as well. There's a voltage drop calculator link on the bottom of the page that, uh, that could be helpful for you. If you have a voltage drop, uh, it can potentially underpower equipment, causing it to perform poorly. Uh, 
testing voltage at the camera position will ensure a proper operation of your equipment. Let's talk a little bit about remote power here um, that in areas where you have no infrastructure. Uh, for uh, remote locations with no power, you should consider how you're going to provide your power over time. This could be for a temporary mission or it could be a permanent installation that requires you to implement plans to supply power, recharge, and replace batteries uh, for continued operation of cameras. Consider how many battery amps you need to power equipment over your specified time frame. Um, you'll need to know the power draw of the equipment. This uh, could be a combined power draw of multiple cameras, uh, your switch, and your wireless transmitter. Um, then you also need, the other uh, key factor that you need is determining what your battery capacity is that you've got available. Then you can divide your battery capacity by the power draw of the equipment to determine how many hours the equipment will run before a recharge is needed. If you have to tie multiple batteries together, uh, this chart shows you how to configure your connections. When you're connecting batteries in a series, you're doubling the voltage while maintaining the same capacity rating, uh, or other words, in other words, amp hours. Use a jumper cable between the, uh, the negative of the first battery and the positive of the second battery. You'll run your negative wire off of an open connector of the first battery and your positive wire off of the open connector on the second battery. When you're connecting batteries in parallel, you're, uh, you're doubling the capacity or, or the amp hours of the battery while maintaining the voltage of the individual batteries. Now, in this scenario, you, you, you'll use a jumper cable, cable between the positives of both batteries and another jumper cable between the negatives of both batteries. Connect your uh, positive and negative wires to the same battery in order to run your equipment. When you're connecting batteries in a pack, there's important, important things to keep in mind. Don't use uh, two different battery chemistries when connecting multiple batteries. If you do, the voltages will be different. More importantly, the charge rates will be different, different and the capacities of the batteries may be different. Uh, that'll result in a shortened lifespan for your battery pack. You'll want to try to match capacities whenever possible. This will help uh, to avoid discharging one battery quicker than another. Uh, the batteries operate at a combined voltage, so your one cell could discharge more quickly, uh, and that, that will likely uh, discharge the battery too deeply and could cause permanent damage. Uh, standalone power systems, solar power systems, are independent from any electric utility, and they can be used in remote areas where electricity isn't available or not feasible due to cost. Uh, solar systems are used in conjunction with batteries to collect and store your solar energy. Uh, these can be used to power equipment over a long period of time um, over just batteries alone. During the day, electricity is generated and used to power the equipment and charge the batteries. At night and on rainy days, all of the necessary power is provided by batteries. The solar panels capture the solar energy and distribute it to a charge converter before it's stored to the battery and sent to the equipment requiring the power. The solar system voltages range from 12 volts DC to 48 volts DC. You want to make sure you're using the right voltage for your equipment and, um, uh, and also converting the voltage before you connect the equipment. The operating voltage of a solar panel must be high enough uh, to, to charge the battery. The size, the size of the solar array will depend on the size of the system. Uh, this could be large. Uh, depending on, on what you're doing. Don't expect it to be a minimally noticeable installation. Anytime you're using solar, um, it's going to be much more evident. Batteries with the, uh, with the system must be protected from the elements, and they must be able to handle the constant charging and discharging of their cells. Uh, a deep cycle battery is typically recommended. It's important to look for certain characteristics when you're choosing uh, a battery to use. Capacity cycle life, amp hour efficiency, and self-discharge rates are all important uh, in, in your battery choice. Insula installation location uh, uh, does matter. When you're installing solar, you must have a clear view to the south. Uh, when you get, uh, in order to get the most from your solar pa 
panels, you need to point them in the direction that captions the most sun. But there's a number of variables that uh, are, are involved in configuring the best direction. Solar panels should always face true south. Um, if you're in the northern hemisphere, or true north if you're in the southern hemisphere. And true north or south is not the same as magnetic north or south. Um, if you're using a compass to orient your um, your panels, you need to make sure you correct for the difference, which varies from place to place. And the, the way to determine that for your location, you can do a, a web search for magnetic declination magnetic declination and uh, you can find resources for helping you find uh, the correction for your location. And the next question that comes up is what is the angle that the panels should be tilted from horizontal? Uh, as a general rule of thumb, your tilt should be equal to your latitude, plus 15 degrees in the winter, minus 15 degrees in the summer. I'll say that again. Your tilt should be equal to your latitude, plus 15 degrees in the winter, minus 15 degrees in the summer. So maybe that'll help. When it comes to solar energy, not all areas of the country are considered equal. Obviously, some geographic regions get more sun than others. Uh, you can expect more sun in Southern California, for example, than in Washington State. Uh, that doesn't mean uh, that you can't use solar in your less sunny, air, sunny areas. Uh, you just may just have to adjust the uh, size of your solar panel array or battery bank to accommodate for your needs. Do your research for your installation location and decide what design will best accomplish your needs to suit the solution uh, deployment. Here is a link at the bottom of the page um, that provides you with data uh, regarding the solar energy potential uh, for areas around the United States. And I've provided a map with some of those uh, listed out. Camera placement, uh, it's important to take a look at when you're deploying cameras uh, that uh, you realize you're obviously more open to intrusion due to lack of walls and secure barriers. It's important to consider layers of security around sensitive zones. These concentric rings of security are helpful for evaluating the amount of complexity uh, that would be necessary uh, in your security. Let's take a look at a public building. Uh, here I'm using the uh, state capitol in Austin, Texas. Um, we can, if we consider the capitol building to be the highest target, then we can designate it as the secure zone. Here you'll have the tightest security. Guards may pour, perform ID checks for visitors and require employee badges. Uh, you may even have a required bag check and metal detectors in high profile areas. A security could require canine and foot patrol to keep constant visual surveillance on the target areas. In this zone, you, you may need heavy camera surveillance due to this uh, secured nature of the area. Live monitoring of cameras would make sense here. In the next layer out, you're looking at a patrol zone. This uh, would be where guards uh, could be scheduled on foot or vehicle patrol. All employees in security uh, are advised to be aware of their surroundings and on the lookout for trouble. If you see something suspicious, say something. In the patrol zone, medium surveillance would be used. Camera coverage may be in use, but not as prevalent as in the secure zone. As we work our way outward from the secure area, we find the observation zone. Security is more sporadic and a light lever, lighter level of patrolling is required. Employees, uh, and security are aware, but not as intense in their observation. And your surveillance will be lighter here. Cameras uh, should be directed to watch your choke points. In the unsecure zone, uh, this area is not patrolled. Uh, your employees and security are aware of their surroundings, but here you may find little to no surveillance. So let's talk about choke points for a second. These are the areas where most traffic will funnel through. Um, uh, you're talking about driveways, walkways, fences, gates, security gates, etc. Um, cameras should point toward the choke points in order to capture video that will provide relevant data about people or vehicles moving into or out of the area. So let's take a look at our final poll question, David. Okay, let me go ahead and launch that. Um, the question is, <clears throat> why does distance between the camera and target area matter? and select from the following. Use to determine the field of view for the camera, 
important in deciding the focal length for the camera lens. Important to determine the pixels per foot and image clarity, or all of the above. And again, we'll give you a few moments to make your choices. Looks like uh, all votes are in, so let's uh, look at the results. 100% all of the above, Keith. I keep forgetting to take off my mute button, <laughs> so I'm talking away. Yes, uh, number four is the right answer here. All of the above is correct. Um, the distance between the camera and the target area matter because of, of all three reasons. Uh, the distance affects the field of view, focal length, and uh, uh, the focal length for the camera lens, and the resulting clarity or pixels per foot of the image. Um, when you're calculating field of view from a security camera, it's important to know some key information. Uh, most important is the distance from the camera to the target. Um, it's also helpful to make sure your, your camera imager is matched up between your camera and your lens. Um, the next thing we'll look at here is the vertical height and the horizontal width of the image area desired. There's a formula for calculating this information, but it's easier to use an online calculator to determine your field of view. Uh, I've got the link to our, our uh, calculator here on the slide. Uh, when you're considering outdoor placement on buildings, choosing the right placement is vital. I always recommend using a soffit wherever possible. It provides a, a protected location for mounting. It keeps rain and snow and ice off of the camera. It can even shade the camera to help keep sun glare off of the lens which becomes a major key when you're talking about outdoor placement. Um, I think one of our uh, attendees um, uh, brought that up as a point. Um, placement of camera and the, how the sun hits that camera uh, can be a major, cause a major effect in your, uh, uh, the way you have that uh, uh, camera position. So be cautious when you're looking at that. When you put a camera on the corner of a building, make sure you have the proper hardware. Where. Um, the picture above on the bottom left shows a special dome mount that's made for hanging a camera in the proper pos position on the corner of a building. That's especially important, important for PTZ cameras um, that allow you to remotely change your angle of view. Uh, some cameras require mounting using a special junction box like this IQI camera. It has a special box that uh, allows you to hang the camera from the junction box, making your installation easier. easier. Um, make sure you have the right mounting hardware. Uh, uh, you'll see here a, a particular mount that's designed to, to hang a camera bracket from. This can get your camera in the right uh, position so that you can avoid awkward angles and improve the appearance of your uh, installation. And then when you're choosing to mount a camera to a lighting pole, make sure you mount it in such a way as to avoid light hitting the lens and causing lens glare. Also, other strong lights that appear in the camera field of view could cause glare that impedes your image clarity. Um, this is why most cameras are mounted high and angled downward with light sources above and behind the camera. Uh, pa uh, pan tilt zoom cameras can create a false sense of security. The cameras uh, seem very capable because they can pan and tilt and zoom and, and change the area viewable by the user. They're great for demonstrations, but they're often underutilized or misused. A majority of the cameras are used in public areas, um, but uh, uh, PTZs can only see and record where they are currently pointed. PTZ has a potential to view enormous areas uh, at any given time, and um, you can even put it on a tour so that it's looking at different locations uh, at various different times. But if the PTZ is on a tour and looking at the front door, an event happens at the vehicle gate, that event will be missed. Um, only one in 10 cameras being deployed today are PTZ cameras. Most uh, 
uh, installation uh, techs are using multiple fixed megapixel cameras in their place. Multiple megapixel cameras can cover the same area as a PTZ with less cost. In addition, the multiple fixed megapixel cameras can keep surveillance over the entire area instead of uh, uh, leaving areas uncovered uh, while the camera is pointed in a different direction. Uh, let's take a quick look at uh, pixels per foot. Um, that's a metric that delivers a specific quality level. Uh, for example, if you use that metric, uh, it, it should enable the selection of the right resolution for the scene. Uh, the image uh, following the pixel per foot metric should deliver a predictable level of quality. Um, the, the two factors that uh, help in calculating pixel, pixel per foot are the number of horizontal pictures pixels in a video feed of your camera. And the second is the width of the field of view at the target area. You want to make sure you properly identify the horizontal pixel count and do not confuse it with the vertical one uh, or the overall resolution. Uh, for instance, a 720p camera has a total resolution of one megapixel, but its horizontal pixel count is 1280. Um, and that's typically called 1280 by 720. So the first number in that pair is the horizontal count. So that's the one that, that counts in measuring your pixel per foot. Um, field of view is simply measuring the horizontal width you need to capture at the target area. In determining a pixel per foot in relation to the uh, level of detail desired, um, you can reference this chart below or also the link um, to Vicon, uh, Vicon's pixel per foot calculator. Um, just keep in mind there's three levels of detail that you'd be looking at, general detail, forensic detail, and high detail. General detail allows you to capture uh, general movement and activity. You won't have any fine detail that can be determined. Forensic detail helps you to start being able to be, make out uh, facial features, uh, specific model of a car, etc. And then high detail um, provides the best detail and clarity available for the scene. Um, this is where you can even start to make out um, identifying features in the face, um, clearly identify the driver of a car, or uh, in the right scenario, even be able to make out uh, um, the denomination of money changing hands. I'm going to skip a slide here and talk briefly about uh, uh, crime prevention through environmental design. Now, this is not talking necessarily about technology, but about design. Um, uh, SEPTED, crime prevention through environmental design, is an approach to determining deterring criminal behavior through the way an area is designed with environment in mind. Uh, so SEPTED strategies uh, rely on the ability to influence the offender decisions that precede criminal acts. Um, an idea there, uh, the idea there is that uh, implementations of SEPTED will occur within the urban environment and you can actually alter the physical design of communities in order to deter criminal activity. And that's the main goal. Uh, the principles here uh, are to um, you know, perhaps uh, design a building format or even an entire urban neighborhood to help limit traffic flow and maximize visibility in high priority areas. The idea here is to increase the opportunity for eyes on the street. You don't want to put a long, uh, tall hedge of bushes in front of a row of windows when you can use a small uh, row of bushes that people inside can see through to see uh, a potential criminal activity occurring. And here's an example of that. Uh, you see the picture on the before side has uh, lots of uh, uh, sh uh, shrubbery and, and brush and trees uh, that are potentially impeding the view after the fact. Um, they've trimmed all that up and cleared it out and improved the, uh, the criminal prevention um, just by increasing the ability to see from this building out to, uh, out to the public area. Um, improving lighting at night can greatly improve your ability for people uh, and cameras to see activity, so helping with lighting is is good as well. So that is where we stand. Uh, we've uh, talked about environmental concerns, transmission of video and data, uh, rugged edge devices, power considerations, and many, many other things that we've included here today. So with that said, uh, David, uh, do we have any questions that we can help answer? 
Sure. Um, we've got a few minutes left here. Let me just uh, gather uh, some questions here. Um, well, there was a point made about consideration for sun exposure. So in those instances, we would look at a, a wide dynamic uh, camera. And then we've right, had... Right, that, could, that um, could be helpful. Go ahead, Keith. I was saying that could be helpful, and um, I addressed that uh, with uh, some of the, uh, the information about where you can place cameras to help avoid, uh, help keep uh, um, direct sunlight from hitting off of the camera or even um, even uh, fake illumination like uh, like lighting from a parking lot, etc. Good. Yeah. And um, then another question came in, how do I know what type of PoE um, I need? Okay, there's a couple of things to, to keep in mind. Um, uh, there's two types of PoE power available. One is PoE and one is PoE plus. Your standard PoE uh, is is uh, designed to provide up to 15.4 watts of DC power to each device. Um, and that's a, a minimum of 44 volts of DC and 350 milliamps. So only 12.95 watts of power is assured uh, that the device, uh, as there is some sometimes loss of power in the cable. So that's enough power for most um, most IP cameras. So if you're gonna run uh, more pieces of equipment off of a, a PoE power, you want to make sure you're calculating that and uh, determining if you need to go to PoE plus. That provides up to 25.5 watts of power in DC, and that can use to either to provi provide power to uh, pieces of equipment that, that need more power or to multiple pieces of equipment. So um, PoE plus was, uh, was designed to help meet the needs of, of higher powered equipment. And um, so the, the key there is making sure you know what your, what your equipment is drawing, and you'll find those answers in your specifications. Um, occasionally, you'll have an IP device that has a proprietary power supply, um, and that might provide non-standard uh, PoE power for a device. Use the recommended device in those situations. Uh, most times, you won't have a choice. You'll have to use that device. Um, and sometimes you'll have a device that simply won't power with PoE. Um, you might have to rely on a local a local uh, a power supply or local cable, uh, local power for that. So you just have to be cautious there. All right, thank you, Keith. I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up the webinar. We're right on our deadline of one o'clock. Um, all the questions that we did not get to, we will provide answers um, via email. So. Thank you for attending our webinar today. Please remember that we pre uh, present the Step Into Security webinar series monthly. We record these, and tonight, today's webinar should be posted on our website in a few few days, lensec.com. We'll follow up to you by email to provide you with the webinar link. Also, we'll be sharing the presentation slide deck and the questions uh, and answers from today's event in the coming days. Um, we'll also uh, provide you uh, with links to all of the uh, calculators and tools that were mentioned throughout the presentation. If you're interested in a completion certificate for today's event, please respond to our survey. They will survey that will be delivered to you upon completion of the webinar. And uh, for future reference, our topic for November's webinar is threat assessments for schools and universities. So please take time to register for the uh, next webinar. And this completes our webinar. I hope you have a great rest of your week. Thank you for attending.